What on earth is God doing? That is the overall series title of a four-part series on the book of Habakkuk. Today's message three, next time will be message four and the final one. And uh, this message is going to deal virtually with one verse. Mainly, we've been taking a whole chapter at a time, but I had to come back to this verse. Habakkuk 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. We'll come to read it in a moment. Because it's the crucial verse for understanding the book of Habakkuk. That God was retaining a righteous remnant who understood what it is to be right with God by faith and trusting God's faithfulness to see them through. It is also the pivotal text for the whole of the Old Testament telling us that we come to God through faith, but not through works. And uh, I think it is a key verse in the New Testament. It's quoted at least three times, referred to on many occasions, but quoted at least three times. And it is the foundation, cornerstone text for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the gospel has so many rich dimensions to it, and uh, it's not fair to narrow it down because the gospel is so broad, providing so much of peace and strength and joy and fulfillment, of course. But without this teaching of justification by faith, in other words, how we are declared righteous in the presence of God by faith and faith alone, without that we do not have a gospel. Now please allow me to flow today because there is an urgency in my spirit And if I raise my voice, it's not because I think you're deaf. There's an urgency in my spirit because this is the word of the Lord for our generation. We shall see that this verse, rightly interpreted by Luther and others who have understood the real understanding, that's Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, that's another person. Martin Luther of the Reformation, we'll come and look at him in a moment. But when we understand that this verse has rightly understood, we have no right to depart from it, because if we do, we'll be sure that our nation will continue under the wrath of God, under the judgment of God, but there is only one way out of that situation, and that is the righteousness that God provides by faith in Christ alone. So let's read Habakkuk 2, verses 1 to 4. I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. This was Habakkuk's second complaint. Remember, his first complaint was, why aren't you judging the sins of Judah? We're all trying to be righteous here, and you're not helping because the wicked are prospering, and we're being overrun by the wicked. So God says, I'll answer that question. I'm going to judge Judah. I'm sending the Babylonians. They're going to take the lot of you away. They're going to take you out. And and uh, uh, Habakkuk's second complaint is, how could that be? How can you use people more uh, more wicked than us to judge us? In our society today, it seems that God is doing the same thing, calling our attention through the prospering of wicked counsel, wicked men, wicked women, being in places of power and influence. False philosophies, false ideologies, false religions are flourishing, and God's people are being swamped by unrighteousness. Is it that God also today is calling our attention to what's happening in our society? That God himself is handing our society over to eat the fruit of its ways, and if that's the case, where is there hope? Do we just give up now, or is there hope? So, Habakkuk now climbs his watchtower and prays again a second time for God to give him the answer to this complaint, and then this is the answer, verse 2. Then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. There is a false message and a correct message. We need to make sure as carriers of the tablet, I'm not talking about uh, personal uh, devices here and, and, and tablets and so forth. I'm talking about carrying the word of God into our society. Are we carrying the right word? Are we saying to people, come to Jesus and you will be happy forever? Come to Jesus, you'll have no problems. Come to Jesus, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and all the rest of it. Or are we looking at the real gospel of Jesus Christ, is that the blood of Jesus saves you from the Christless eternity that the Bible calls hell and gives you a future and a hope, and you can flow with that destiny of the Lord. 
that a runner may carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it shall surely take place. It will not be delayed. So God is saying, the vision that I'm about to let you know, and the vision that I want you to flow with, which is like flowing with me in the river of destiny, is going to end up in the end of the end times. We're not going to see it all here and now. It's going to be fulfilled one day and in two great promises. If we remember, first of all, in chapter 2, verse 14, the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It shall happen. In the new heavens and the new earth, where, where righteousness is at home, God's glory is going to be manifested. We believe it's going to be manifested in the church. God will get glory to his name by Christ Jesus in the church. And at the very end of chapter 2, that verse 20 describes that second great purpose of God. He's going to manifest his presence in his holy temple. And we are the temple of the Lord. Living stones being built up into a holy temple. God is going to manifest the power and presence of Christ and the glory of Jesus in the body of Christ, the church. Even though it might look like we are losing ground. It might look, certainly in Britain and Europe, that we're living in a post-Christian era. But God hasn't finished with us yet. God is going to move powerfully. So we see that when things appear dark, God always has a plan. He knows what he's doing. When we learn to see things from his perspective, we can begin to flow with the river of destiny. God uses difficult circumstances to shape our lives and to prepare us for his glory because his story is bigger than you and me. The plan of God is bigger than your plans and God says, don't worry, I've got everything under control. Lord, the wicked are outrunning the righteous. Don't worry, I've got everything under control. Lord, they're burning churches down, different parts of the world. Don't worry, I've got it under control. Oh God, people in Bradford, Muslims who convert to Christ, are being persecuted, run out of their house and homes, treated appallingly, and the police seem to do nothing. Don't worry, I've got it under control. God is saying, I'm going to manifest my glory, and it's happening, and you must be part of it. And then we say, God, well, if this is the case, what is then the real hope? And we come to it, Habakkuk 2, verse 4. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves. Let's take that personally and individually. Are we trusting in ourselves? Are we saying, God, thank you for your salvation, but I can make a little bit on my own? Are we saying, God, thank you for your word, but, you know, I would like to just discuss a few points with you. I don't think that we should take it quite as literally as that. After all, society has changed. That's the thinking of the world that is creeping into the church. Are you trusting in yourself? Are you trusting in human wisdom? Are you trusting in the arm of flesh? Are you trusting in your own righteousness? God says, those are the proud. And because of that, they trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. I want to make sure you understand this to mean the righteous will live by the faithfulness of their God. That's the correct understanding. So my message today, flowing with the river of destiny, this verse gives us hope. Hook into this verse, understand what this verse is, believe it, live it, preach it, proclaim it, and you will flow with the river of destiny. No other verse will unlock the destiny of God to you in quite the same way. Come with me now, in your mind's eye, to Rome, almost 500 years ago. Come now to the St. John's Basilica, the Lateran Basilica, before even St. Peter's is built. And I want you to zoom in on a rather un kind of, you know, undistinguishable man, indistinguishable man. He's a monk, Catholic monk, seeking to be faithful to all the dictates of his Augustinian order, a man who had a brilliant career ahead of him in law, but was hurting inside 
desperately afraid of the wrath of God, a conscience that had been alerted, would to God that everybody today in Britain will be having as their first question in their mind, how can I be right with God? Because God is real, God is true, and his righteousness means that the day of judgment is coming. I'm not talking about Arnie Schwarzenegger. There's a day of judgment beyond that, my friend, that isn't Hollywood fiction or fantasy. It's the revelation of God's word, the judge of all the earth is coming. How can I be right with God was his question. He obeyed every rule, including this promise of having a few years off purgatory by crawling on his knees, praying the right prayers on the Lateran steps there in St. John's Basilica. What was that about? The Emperor Constantine's mother brought, Helena, apparently brought the steps leading up to the palace where Jesus was judged. In Jerusalem. They were attached there in this specific place and the Pope had decreed that if you crawl up these steps on your knees you will get remission from certain number of years in purgatory. In fact certain popes have given different ones. Currently it's seven years off but there were people in the past who had all of their sins forgiven just by crawling up and saying the right thing. That's the unbiblical and um, unbiblical teaching on indulgences. The idea is, is that in medieval Catholicism, people were not so terrified of hell because they were told that if the priest grants you absolution, you will get to heaven eventually. But first of all, you have to go through purgatory. To purge your soul by punishment and suffering of its attachment to sin and to pay the price for those sins or at least the temporal guilt attached to them. Quite a technical thing. In Martin Luther's day, that's the monk we're talking about, in Martin Luther's day it was dreadfully used as cash raising and expenditure, uh, for the, uh, raising cash for, for various uh, secular princes and also for the Pope to rebuild or to build St. Peter's. It was a terrible situation. But the Bible shows us that God has a different plan. The just shall live by faith. And as this monk, Martin Luther, in all sincerity, crawls up the stairs repeating his prayers on this Lateran staircase, the words of the prophet, Habakkuk 2 verse 4, came to his mind. The just shall live by faith. And he thought, what am I doing here? This doesn't make sense. And he said, this is the key to my problem. He didn't know that his sins could only be forgiven by faith in the person and work of Jesus, apart from his own works. Luther's son wrote of this experience as he repeated his prayers on the Lateran staircase. The words of the prophet came to his mind. The just shall live by faith. Thereupon, he ceased his prayers and returned to his hometown, Wittenberg in Germany, and took this up as the key foundation of all his doctrine. A little later on, Luther wrote of this text. He said, you know, before I understood that you are righteous not by what you do or by any pronouncement of a priest or a cardinal or a bishop or a pope or even a Pentecostal pastor, God alone pardons you fully and freely through Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross. He said, before I understood this, he said, I began to hate God and was angry with him because it wasn't enough to read the law and to see how the law condemned me. There's none righteous, no, not one. We're all guilty before God, and the law of Moses shows us how guilty we are. He said, that wasn't enough. Then God has to go on tormenting us and frightening us, not just by the law, but by the mis miseries of this life and the miseries of the life to come, and now the gospel torments us because he didn't see it as a message of grace. He saw it as yet more demands which are impossible to fulfill when he discovered the truth of being set free by the blood of Jesus, this were his words. He said, when I saw these words, the just shall live by faith, the just shall live by faith, I felt born again like a new man. 
I entered through the open doors into the very paradise of God. That's why as Bible-believing, evangelical people of God who believe the gospel, we know absent from the body, present with the Lord. We know there is no purging from sins other than the purging of the blood of Jesus Christ, which purges us and washes us from every sin fully and freely by faith and by faith alone. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well... Not only does God use difficult circumstances to shape and prepare us, not only has God everything under control, God says, I'm working out a glorious purpose, and if you hook on to this revelation of what the gospel is, you can flow with me in my river of destiny. Praise God for that. The just shall live by faith. That's how we should see this verse in the first instance. It's how the Apostle Paul took it. It builds on the revelation already given. Do you remember Abraham in Genesis chapter 15? Abraham saw the stars and saw the sand and believed God. God said, I'm going to make your seed more multiple than these. And Abraham looked and he saw and he believed. And in chapter 15 verse 6 it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That is the great prototypical Old Testament believer that sets the pattern for the gospel forever. Explained more fully in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul talks about it. It says, Abraham was justified not by works, but by believing. And David's sins were forgiven not by works, but by believing. It is a gift of forgiveness. God declares you righteous. Not because you deserve it, not because you are righteous in yourself, but he gives to you the gift of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So it begins with this understanding that by faith and faith alone, our sins are forgiven. And if they're forgiven, they're all forgiven. Not that you just have to keep on looking for more and more. When you sing the song again sometime, it's the great one that we know in this church, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, you've t- whatever my lot, you've taught me to say it is well with my soul. And one of those verses goes on to say, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not the part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. God doesn't want you always worrying about what more do you have to do to be acceptable to him. God wants you set free from guilt because Jesus paid the price fully. When Jesus died on the cross... He was God's substitute sacrifice and all the guilt and condemnation that belonged to us was carried by Jesus, the innocent one. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through him. Hallelujah. It's a very easy concept to understand, quite difficult to believe because it's almost too good to be true. But the proud, unbelieving heart that wants to trust in itself, God, stay out of my life. If you must interfere, you're the spare wheel, and I take you out when I need you and put you back when I don't need you. Stay in your place because I I am in control. There are religious versions of self-dependence. There's irreligious versions. Atheists say, I get out of the problem of guilt and condemnation and shame by saying there is no God (laughs) dealt with you, you're out the picture, you don't exist. They'll have a rude awakening, friends, because what may be seen and believed by God has already been revealed to every single person in creation and conscience. And those who, through hardness of heart, reject the knowledge of God are building up greater condemnation to themselves. So we need to understand that this is not playtime here. And we have messed with the gospel, many charismatic and Pentecostal believers, by saying, oh, don't talk about forgiveness so much. We, we've moved on from there. Talk about prosperity. Do you have a gospel of prosperity? Come to Jesus, get rich quick. Especially if you give lots of money to me, because if you give to me, you'll be blessed. <laughs> or even a gospel of healing. 
Now, I believe that God is a super abundant provider. How many can say amen? amen? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be given to you. But that is not the gospel. That's what flows from being right with God. And healing and wonderful things like that. But it's not the gospel. The gospel is this. The wrath of God is coming. And there's only one way of escaping a Christless eternity, and that's the salvation that Jesus offers. And if you're going to live, it's going to be by faith and by faith alone. Hallelujah. But actually, the full understanding of the phrase, the just shall live by faith, the word faith there is better taken as faithfulness. Now, the word faith here means both faith and faithfulness. Of course, it begins with faith. But faithfulness is important. And uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and also in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's taken in that sense. So it's very important to translate this, the just shall live by his faithfulness. But we've got to ask ourselves, whose faithfulness? One modern so-called evangelical preacher, who needs to go back to Martin Luther... When he went back to the Bible, says, this means our faithfulness. We shall live. We shall be saved. We shall live by our faithfulness. In other words, it is our faithfulness in the end that counts whether we go into heaven or not. Think about it carefully. Don't forget, Martin Luther isn't just a Protestant bashing Catholics. He was a Catholic. So they threw him out. This isn't just Lutherism and Catholicism or Protestantism against Catholicism. This is God's word spoken to all the world. One way to be saved through faith in Christ. Think about it. You're standing before God right now. Try and imagine if it's okay. This is just pretend right for right now. I don't think it's really happening. And if you go to be with Jesus in the next five minutes, we'll give you a good burial because you've gone home. Amen and amen. All right. Now, standing before God... And there you are at the gates of heaven. And you're thinking, as I knock on this door, this is only a picture, I don't know if it works like this, but just a picture of spiritual truth. Knocking on the door, and the door opens, and you wonder, is he going to let me in? What would you rather be depending on? Your faithfulness or Jesus' faithfulness? I tell you, if you're depending on your faithfulness, as R.T. would say, I wouldn't be in your shoes for all the world. Because we know there is only one righteous. That's him, not us. How could we ever live a life of such perfect faithfulness that will guarantee our entrance into heaven? No, only he was good enough to unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. So this verse is teaching us to depend not on our righteousness, but his righteousness. Not on our obedience, but his obedience. Not on our faith, but his faith. Not on our faithfulness, but his faithfulness. Because the one who's called us is faithful, and he will do it. So we live by the faithfulness of Jesus. So now the issue of pride Trusting yourself. Trusting yourself. You know, as human beings, we are naturally rebellious against God. We don't want anybody to rule over us. Don't you tell me. Don't tell me. Who are you to tell me? And that same thing is kind of projected on God. Who do you think you are to tell me how to live? I'll live my own way. And if I agree with you, okay. But if I don't, forget it, mate. I am the master of my own destiny. I'm the maker of my own fate. This is the godless spirit of the age. And it comes even into the church because we are influenced by the spirit of the age. God, help us. Wash your brains every day in the water of the word of God. Our society says one thing. The Bible says another for a few years, we hold on to the Bible. Then when it's so prevalent in society, say, well, maybe God got it wrong, or it doesn't really matter. A person said to me very recently, they go to a liberal church, a liberal Protestant church, 
and said, you know, well, you can't, Colin, you really can't take the Bible that literally. The Bible was written many years ago. It doesn't really apply like that. Things have changed. It's different. I said, that's a lie from the devil. The Word of God is unalterable, unchangeable. And what is happening, let me tell you, as I said, I'm, I'm full in, in my spirit today. Let me discharge it. I want to frighten you and yell at you. I want you to understand there's an urgency here. London needs this gospel. Yeah. London rests under the judgment of God. In Romans chapter 1, one of those verses, verse 17, one of those verses which picks up this in the New Testament, the just shall live by faith. The background to that is this. Paul says, I can't wait to come to Rome to preach the gospel in Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Why is he so excited? Because he then goes on to describe not just Roman society, but the state of the human heart, because all we have sinned turned away from God, even though what can be known of God is available to our natural understanding through creation and conscience. We've rejected that knowledge and are heading hell, headstrong into hell and condemnation. And God says, I, my, my wrath is being revealed against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of sin. And that means London ungodliness, London unrighteousness of sin, handing London over, handing British society over, riding headlong, eating the fruit of our ways, sliding straight to hell. That's the truth, ladies and gentlemen. That's the Bible. That's the Word of God. But Paul says, I'm so happy because there is a hope. There is a righteousness that's coming from God. It's a righteousness from faith. And that righteousness turns away God's wrath and we enter into the river of His purpose, enter into the river of His destiny by faith and faith alone. And so we thank God this righteousness is from faith to faith. From faith, Christ's faith. Do you know to be righteous before God, you've had to have believed completely, not one doubt all of your life. None of us have been there. Probably none of us is there right now. Do you still not have doubts? But Jesus perfectly believed for you. So his faith and faithfulness is revealed and you ratify that in your heart by saying, I put my trust in the faithfulness of Jesus. I put my trust in the faith of Jesus. What Jesus did for me on the cross, I transfer all my trust for myself to him. Hallelujah. And henceforth I live by the faithfulness of God. This is the river of destiny. The only vision that shall is worth following it's the only vision that shall be successful. It's for an appointed time for the end. It's going to all culminate in the return of Jesus Christ. And in the meantime, we must be faithful witnesses, walking in faithfulness, proclaiming the word, thanking God for the real gospel. The Reformation is not over, my friends. Martin Luther got it right. He did not get it wrong. He, in fact, he innovated nothing. He renovated everything. That's by Dr. Atkinson, who write, writes on Luther. That's not Bruce Atkinson. That's another one. <laughs> the only message that can change a broken, fallen world, the only way to flow with the river of God. God is calling us as members of Kensington Temple alongside all others in the body of Christ in London, Britain, and Europe, to hold on to the gospel. Don't exchange it for anything else. Only in the gospel is God's grace contained good news. It's based on his faithfulness, not yours. It's based on his grace, not your works. It's based on Jesus' obedience, not yours. We trust in the faithfulness of God and in the righteousness of God. Here's my take-home message for you. I've already sent it out to all cell leaders. Now, cell leaders, do not fail to pick up your email today because there's discussion points I want you to take into your week, even beginning today when you have cell, certain cell meetings. This is what will guide you. This, will, this is your take-home passage. Actually, this is your take-home message, take-home to glory message. It'll last you from now until Jesus comes. Have faith in the faithfulness of God. Whatever circumstance you're in, God is with you. He can turn it around. He's working all things together for good. His purpose is being fulfilled. 
And as we stay faithful to God, the only way of doing that is trusting his faithfulness. If we stay faithful to God by trusting in his faithfulness, God will still yet use us. And maybe a revolution will take place in our day. The key to revival is the book of Romans. The key to revival is the gospel. Let's have a radical revolution, a gospel revolution in our city. Believe it, live it, enjoy it, get filled with this message and let the whole world know that there is still yet more grace for our generation because of the mercy of God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Thank you, Jesus. How wonderful it is to know that if you put your faith and trust in Christ, you transfer it from yourself, put your faith and trust in Christ, what Christ has done, you will be saved. He doesn't promise you when you do this, you'll start feeling good. Everything will work away, your bills will be removed. Nobody will hate you ever again. Even your mother-in-law will like you. Oh, these are false promises. But the promise is true. You will be saved. Oh, God will give you not just a new hope, but a new life. A life that loves God. And you will have your conscience cleansed. You don't have to go crawling up any lateran steps or doing any extra works to try and earn your favor with God or earn your forgiveness. All your sins are totally forgiven in Christ on the cross if you put your trust in him. Chains are gone.